Hi, my name is Chris Bergen. I'm a software engineer here at the deck. I've been here nine or ten months now. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm going to see lots of interns. Um, so this is going to be a little bit unorthodox in the deck talk. Um, it's not about technology, product management, design. Um, it's about history. Um, so I'm going to make a statement that I'm not going to back up. Um, and it's that history is important and shapes who we are. Um, and I think we can kind of all agree on that. So instead of spending the next 25 minutes or even telling you why history is important, I figure let's just dive into the history of Louisville. Um, Louisville is a very, very cool city that I love a lot. Um, but most importantly, am I qualified to give this talk? And the answer is me. Um, so I don't have any formal history training. My wife has a minor in history, but I don't think I can claim that. Um, but, uh, I love the city of Louisville. So I was born here. Um, I have no intention of leaving at the moment. Uh, I think it's a great city. Um, and I actually collect books about Louisville's history. So at the current moment, I've got about 60 books about Louisville's history, ranging from like 1905 to 2018. Um, so there's a lot out there. Um, a little bit of backstory to that. I was in Lexington um, five years ago, and I just stumbled across a book called The Days and uh, and I don't know if anybody here grew up in Milltown. If you want to raise your hand, if you know where that is. Okay, sweet. A couple people. It is east of here, east of Linden, towards the end of Jefferson County. Um, but it's got a lot of history in it, and that book kind of just got me sparked on the history of Louisville. Um, and from there, I've just been collecting books on the history of Louisville at bookstores or wherever I can find them. It's just a great city. Um, yeah, so it should be a lot of fun. But let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's talk about the founding of Louisville. Um, so Louisville, I put here, it's three in one. Louisville was not always just Louisville. The city that we know as Louisville started as three different cities. So it started as Portland, Shipping Port, and Louisville. And this is a terrible graphic. It's the best I can find. Um, and you might think, why did all the three of these cities start here? This is a lot of cities, and there's two in Indiana. So you've got five cities all founded around the same time, late 1700s, early, mid 1800s. I'm just going to tilt that away a little bit. Um, and then they all became one city. So they were actually all founded here because of the falls of the Ohio. Um, so the Ohio River, from where it starts, and it flows, and it's the main tributary for the Mississippi River, and then that flows all the way down to the Gulf. Um, in that entire span, there's no major obstacles except for one. So it's known as one of the best rivers in the world to transport cargo, people, it's smooth. But the only obstacle is right here in the city of Louisville. Um, and it's a 22 foot drop, known as the Falls of Ohio and the rapids that come with it. Um, and it's nearly impossible to get through, except for like three or four weeks a year where the water is high enough where a boat can come through. But even then, it's risky, it's dangerous, especially we're talking like, you're in 1810, boats are not built the same then as they are now. Um, it was not a safe thing to do. So what had to happen is people would come down the river delivering cargo. They would stop in Louisville. They would take that cargo, unload it from the boat, load it up onto horses, wagons, and they would take that all the way down to Portland or all the way over to Shipping Port, which is on the other side of the Falls of the Ohio. And then they would load that back up on a boat and go on their way. And it would do the exact same thing coming back. Um, so here's another diagram. This is an older diagram, and you have to look at it sideways. Um, but the top is to the east, the bottom is to the west. I don't know why I didn't turn sideways. Um, <laughs> but you can see that, uh, that the river comes around and it forms these rapids. And they've known this for, I mean, that's why the city's here. Um, so what ended up happening is by 1837, I believe it was. Um, let me check my, my facts here. Um, yeah, 1837. All of the cities were annexed into Louisville. So it started one by one. Shipping Port was annexed into Louisville kind of forcibly. Louisville, when they printed a new directory for basically like, here are all the houses and here's who live there, they just included Shipping Port. Um, so they kind of just said, you're a part of us now. Um, and then Portland was annexed in 1837 into Louisville. They had basically grown together. Portland had expanded all the way to the east and Louisville all the way to the west, and they were one. And Louisville was bigger, so the name stuck. Um, and that's how we ended up with one city known as Louisville right here that sits right along this bit. Um, fun thing to note, this image is a little later. It's got a proposed canal on it. Um, 
and this was the um, Louisville Portland Canal, and it was basically um, people got tired of unloading their goods, and this is what turned into the uh, McAlpine locks and dams, and this is how you get from the upper portion of the falls to the lower. Um, it's pretty safe to say that without the falls, probably none of us would be sitting here. Um, without them, there would have been no reason to start a city here. It's not. There's no real advantage besides that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the naming of the city. Um, so the city was named by George Rogers Clark. He's recognized as the European American founder of Louisville. It's unlikely that he was the first one here. We know that. He showed up. There were other people here um, long before him. But he's recognized as the founder. And he named the city after King Louis XVI. He helped out in the Revolutionary War, and he wanted to name something after him. So um, the naming to the city is pretty simple. Um, and here's a nice photo of, this is the Portland Bull Canal, and I think this photo was taken in like 1860? I'm going to try to give you a date when all the photos were taken. Um, but it was a very small canal. It is much larger now. It's got two locks and dams, but this was the original canal. Um, and we're lucky that it even ended up on the Louisville, or the Kentucky side. Um, Cincinnati was the big city that pushed for the canal, and they actually wanted it on the Indiana side kind of disrupt the monopoly that Louisville and Portland had over trade. Um, so we're lucky that it's even here. Um, so we're going to move on. Let's talk about the late 19th century. Um, this is a super interesting portion of Louisville's history. Um, and a lot is going on here. Um, can we papers? Um, so we were a industrial town at this point in time. Uh, and I'll show you this image. Um, most of our income economically came from industrial things, um, all the way up really through World War II. Um, so we were a huge supplier of synthetic rubber during World War II, the largest. Um, but this photo is actually from just after the turn of the century, and this is actually Louisville Gas and Electric. You can see it on the sign right there. It says Gateway to the South, which is the nickname the city used to have, Louisville Gas and Electric. But these factories were everywhere. Um, and I promise they're not putting out clean materials. It's, it was bad. Pollution in the city was terrible. Um, smog was terrible. Um, that's one reason Clifton was founded. Um, wealthy people who could afford to get out of the city would be Clifton. A lot higher ground above the smog. Um, so you'll see a lot of larger houses over there and a lot of older houses. It's one of the older areas of the city just because they were getting away. Um, and if you look at most of the photos you're going to see in the next section, every single photo there is some sort of smokestack that's picked in. Um, it was not a great time for uh, the uh, health of the city in terms of air quality. Um, and for a while, we actually gained the nickname um, Graveyard of the West. Um, and that was in the, the mid-1800s um, because we were pretty far west, um, relatively speaking. Um, and we, uh, our air quality was terrible and our water quality was terrible. People suffered from massive tidal outbreaks. So it's a lovely nickname that's moved on and now we have some of the best water in the nation. Uh, so during this time period, I don't know if anybody's heard of this, the Southern Exposition. Anybody want to raise their hand if they've heard of this? Yeah, a couple of people have heard of the Southern Exposition. Uh, the Southern Exposition was a five-year event and it happened for 100 days each year. Um, and this is a depiction of the building. Um, the building was on what is now Central Park, Old Louisville, St. James Court. Um, that's where this building was. And it's one, I think it may be the largest two-story wooden building ever built in the United States. It was huge. Um, and it was not meant to last as long as it did. But the Southern Exposition was industrial. Over half the space was dedicated for industrial purposes, showing off machining equipment, um, farming equipment, factory production equipment. Um, and, very interestingly, um, light bulbs. Uh, so the Southern Exposition had 4,600 of Edison's um, incandescent light bulbs, um, powered by eight steam generators. And you can see the picture of a couple of them sitting off in the corner right here in one of these photos. And you can see two in that top right photo kind of cut off. Um, and this was a huge display of light bulbs. So at this point in time, the Southern Exposition is I think 1883 to 87. Um, a lot of people have not seen a light bulb um, still at this point, um, and especially not this many in the same location. So this would have just been an absolutely breathtaking sight to see. Like you walk into this like tent, and it's lit with 4,600 different light bulbs. Um, and it took me quite some time to find this photo, but I do have a couple other photos of it. Um, it also looks like a 
huge fire hazard because I bet you it would have been very warm in that room. Um, that's a lot of light bulbs. Um, but yeah, it was just a, it was a manufacturing era. Our city was founded on manufacturing, industry, industrialness. Um, and you don't see a lot of that left today. Most of that went, went away in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s is really when it started to fade out. And that was no longer our city's like primary like economic means. Um, and another very cool thing that happened during this time is we got our first skyscraper. Um, and you may be wondering like, I pick these events. A lot of these events and things, I there's so much going on that I just pick where I'm interested in. I wanted to share this one I picked because it actually sat right across the street where the BDT building is. Until 66, I think it's when we tore it down. Yep, yeah, 66. 1966. Um, so this was built in the late 1800s. Um, the exact date, because I want to do that. And 1890 is when um, it was construction started. It took a couple years to finish. Um, and it was the tallest building in Kentucky for a couple of decades. Um, and it was modeled after the first skyscraper in Chicago. Um, it was a beautiful building, and what's interesting about this building, I think carries on until today, is that if you read the sign over there in front of the building, there's, uh, my wife calls them history on a stick, um, and they're all over the city, um, and they're excellent. Um, they'll tell you so much about what's going on, they have great commentary a lot of times. Um, but the commentary in this one is that this building was built for revitalization of the city. They basically wanted to improve the economic status and revitalize this area. The building was torn down for the exact same reason it was built, um, for revitalization of the area. And in reality, not a lot was gained from it. It's not a very beautiful building sitting over there. Some people may think it is, I don't. Um, but a lot of times there was this sense, especially in the 60s, of tear it down, rebuild it, and now we're left with a lot of the same that we were left with now, and a lot of people would love to see this building still standing across the street. Um, what's fun is, you can't see in these photos, um, but there, the stone on the bottom is red. And you can actually get a stone inset on the corner over there at 4th and Main from the foundation stone. That's all that's left. Um, but it's also really fun just looking at old photos, like looking behind this photo and saying, like, like that's where the vault house stood. That's where all of this was, or all of this is going to be in the future. Um, but yeah, it was really cool. It was our first skyscraper. It was a big deal. I now stand it's not a skyscraper. And there's a photo of it being torn down the 60s. Um, there's a couple better ones out there. Um, yeah, sad to see it go. So the next thing we're going to talk about is something I really, really love. It's parks. Um, and I think parks are super important to rule history. So we love parks as a city. You can see that from the number of parks we have now. Like if you visit our city and visit another city, the amount of parks we have is just, it's crazy. Every neighborhood of the city has a park in it, if not multiple <coughs> state parks. Um, and a lot of our parks are, I mean, absolutely beautiful. There's the whole Louisville Loop. Um, and we really like parks here too. So this is a photo of Central Park. And if you've been in Central Park, this um, walkway, I guess that's what we would call it, is actually still there. Um, it looks a tiny bit different, but it sits right there at the, the middle of Central Park. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Central Park is south of here. Um, in between, I think it's in between 3rd and 4th Streets. Um, making sure I get that right. Um, just before, kind of, it's in the old Louisville area, but before you like hit a lot of the mansions from Old Louisville. Uh, it's an absolute beautiful park. And it was designed by, let me make sure I get his first name right, um, Frederick Olmsted. Um, so he was the designer of Central Park in New York as well. Um, and this was not the only thing he designed in Louisville. Um, there is, he designed most of Southern Parkway in the vice spoke wheel shape of Southern Parkway. Um, and then his sons carried on his tradition. And a lot of stuff that they designed is actually credited to him. Because um, they named themselves Olmsted something. So there's a little park in Clifton that kind of sits in between the little valley that I think was designed by either him or uh, his sons. Um, but I mean, even to this day, when the park launched, it was a huge hit. People loved the park. Uh, they could not get enough of it. And I think it's very interesting that that's carried on to today. Just, it's fun to see how a city's love of parks can start now and carry on, I mean, even to today. Um, so yeah, that will end the like, late 19th century. Uh, and we can go on into the 20th century, which is probably one of my favorite Louisville's history. Um, and it's fun to always be learning about the city of Louisville. Um, so something I learned about 
while I was doing some more research, putting this talk together, was a guy that I had never heard of before, and his name was um, William Warley, is I think how you pronounce it. And I could not find a photo of him. I searched for probably an hour and a half, and I could find no, <clears throat> no photographic evidence of this man, but he clearly exists. Um, but in the, I think it was 1914, the city passed um, racial zoning laws, basically saying if a certain area had more than 50% of um, whites, then an African American or any other race could not live in that area. Um, it was absolutely crazy, and it followed laws that were passed in Georgia, South Carolina. Um, it was nuts. Um, so this guy was the president of the India in, in a NAACP, sorry, I tripped up over my words there, um, local chapter, and he basically started a test case by attempting to buy a property and then claiming that the law would not let him pay for that property. Um, that took, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that these racial zoning laws were unconstitutional. Um, so it was definitely like a landmark case that we don't hear a lot about, um, and that it's definitely, in all my research, I could not find a lot about it. Um, so if anybody knows about it, feel free to come up. Um, but yeah, that one I don't have any slides for because I could not find any photos. Um, but the next thing I definitely do have photos for. Um, so the next thing is the 37th flood. This is a pretty, uh, it was a catastrophic flood, um, but it's a pretty well known flood. Um, so basically, for two weeks, it rained and rained and rained, and it did not stop in the Ohio Valley, the Northeast. Uh, and the gauge where we measure water on the upper part of the dam is 22 feet deep right there. Water levels were 30 feet over that um, at the crest of the flood, which I think was January 27. Um, and 70% of the city was underwater. Um, and when I say that, it's not the city that you think of now. So right now, um, all of Jefferson County is considered the city of Louisville. They're one and the same. Like if you're on the far south side of Jefferson County, you can still put on your address that you live in Louisville. Um, that was not the case beforehand. So this red outline here is what you'll see is what used to be the city of Louisville before the merger. Um, the merger didn't happen too long ago. Um, but 70% of the city was underwater. And you can't see some of these numbers, but they're astonishing. Like up in Portland, there's one spot where the estimated depth was 23 feet. Um, sorry, it's his name. Um, it was astonishing. Um, and the flood changed Louisville in reality forever. So we're still suffering from the impacts of this flood. So after the 37 flood, the city was like, we've got to build a flood wall. We can't let this happen again. It was absolutely devastating. Uh, we'll go back to some of the photos. Um, this photo right here is on 4th Street, um, down near what I think is uh, Muhammad Ali now, which was in Walnut. Um, and this photo on the right, if you notice that, if you'll recognize that there's these three buildings stacked here, you might recognize that back building. That's the Humana building over on Main Street. Yep, and those uh, two uh, buildings in front of it were torn down. So this is probably taken from the bridge, um, but that would have definitely been absolutely flooded. Um, and then, I don't remember, this top photo, is, it says in the photo, is Broadway looking east. Where at on Broadway? But you can just search 37 flood if you want to see more photos. And there's photos of every inch of downtown. So like where we're standing at now, you may not find photos of, because if you look at the map, there was a certain area of downtown that is slightly higher than the rest of the city, and it was spared. But for the most part, you're going to find photos of all of this. Um, if you're ever driving down Lexington and Grinstead, if you look to the right, you'll see a little sign that denotes a high water mark. So towards that direction, that's all the way where the water came to. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but I want you to kind of keep a mental image of this in your mind. So right now, where all the flooding has happened is kind of center of the city to the west. Um, and it absolutely would have been flooded all the way. They just didn't map that because that was outside of the city boundary, but there's definitely maps that contain that. Um, so look where that is. And then the next map I'm going to show you is a, um, it's not a population density statistic or population count statistic. It's an economic status statistic from 2010. And it's a map that will show you um, where, uh, basically where wealthier people live and where poor people live. Um, so if you look at this map, it's almost the exact opposite of the flood. Um, so after the 37 flood, um, there was another flood in 45. 
Um, 45, it was 10 feet below the 37 flood, but it was almost just as devastating in Portland, um, in the whole West End. So what they did is they raised everything that was um, raised, basically means tear it down. Um, they tore down everything that was within 150 feet of the water. They put up a flood wall that was three feet higher than the crest of the 37 flood, cutting off almost all river access in Portland. Um, and then after that, anyone who had economic status that was like in a high class moved to the east. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. And anyone that would have been considered middle class at the time moved to the south. So our city was fairly condensed. Like these areas in the, like St. Matthews now is packed, but in the 20s, 30s, 40s, St. Matthews was farmland. It was all farmland. It was considered the deep country. Um, and basically it pushed wealth away from these flooded areas because these people did not want to get flooded out. But what happened is that there wasn't nobody living in these areas they went to or in like rural areas of the county and they basically were displaced and had nowhere to go. So a lot of those people needed to back up towards the city center. So you, we end up with this um, uh, just a really interesting inverted map where if you were to lay the two over each other, you would basically see if you could afford not to live or flooded, you did. Uh, now moving to St. Matthews brought all of its own sort of troubles even up until the 50s and 60s. I mean, they had sewage problems like crazy because of the water table level. Uh, but uh, this is something you should definitely do some research into if you're interested. Um, it's a huge part of our city's history that's affected, uh, I mean, it affects us still to this day. Uh, and this is something that may affect us 150 years from now. Um, we really don't know how that will play out long term. Um, so yeah, the 37 flood is maybe one of the most interesting events um, in world's history. Um, so, um, skip that. Um, so we'll talk about the last thing I want to talk about. Um, and we'll let you all go. Um, so when picking this talk, I, I kind of like pick and chose what I want to talk about. I mean, you could probably sit through four years of like history classes on just the city of Louisville. Um, and I'm definitely not the one to teach that because there's probably people in this room who know a lot more than me. But I decided for my last topic to talk about old Louisville. Um, just because Old Louisville holds a very special place for me, I absolutely adore Old Louisville. Um, and it's interesting that I'm talking about Old Louisville after the 37 flood. Um, because Old Louisville, it didn't used to be called Old Louisville, it was just Louisville. Anything with the name Old in it didn't always used to have the word Old there. Um, but Old Louisville's history gets very interesting um, around this time period, and especially around the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so Old Louisville was um, extremely wealthy lived when it was first created. So it was created as a residential area after the Southern Exposition was torn down. Um, and uh, after a while, after the flood, they got flooded too, the smog was bad, they started moving out east. Um, and this area was, uh, uh, it went through some rough years. Um, so in the 60s, this was before Louisville was a National Historic District. Um, if anyone here has ever driven through a wall, there's tons of homes. Third Street is called Millionaire's Row for a portion of it. Um, it's the largest collection of Victorian homes in the United States. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. Most historians know about it. Um, but it used to be much bigger. So in the 60s, and I have a specific date here, um, from 65 to 71, 637 um, buildings and homes were torn down. So this was north of St. Catherine and south of what is now Cardinal Boulevard, which if it turns here, I'm guessing some of you are U of L students, so you know that very well, um, is that south of Cardinal Boulevard, you look around and it's newer buildings. One street over, you look around historic homes. So that was kind of where that line stopped. Um, but basically what happened is that younger people started moving into Old Mobile and they started slowly renovating these homes. Um, and they eventually got to the point where they could get all the area declared as a National Historic District, which is lucky because in the 60s, we probably would have lost a lot more of it had they not done that. Um, it was a time of definitely tearing buildings down. So if you look at lots of buildings around Louisville, when they were torn down and they were raised, it's the 60s. Um, it was just a time of uh, the want to revitalize and change. Um, so I really love the city of Old, or the area of Old Louisville. Um, I hope to live there one day. But some interesting facts. Um, it is the largest historic district to have, um, it has the most, how do I phrase it, it has the most 
pedestrian only walkways of any other historic district. So if you've just driven through Old Louisville, you've not actually seen most of it. You have to get out of your car because um, there's 11, and they're called walking courts um, throughout the area of Old Louisville. And one of the most famous is the Belgravia Court, if you've heard of it. But basically, the house is faced inward to like a lush green area um, with a walkway. So there's no way to drive a car in front of the house. So there's tons of homes and places in Old Louisville you can't see unless you're walking. Another one is called Fountain Court, just off of St. James Court. Uh, and they're beautiful. You should absolutely check them out and look at them. Um, and it's just a great area of the city. It's got a ton of history. Um, and if you're interested in architecture, it's awesome. Or if you're interested in people who lived in the city, um, it's really cool as well because there's so many um, uh, just famous people who live there, but also people who were very like transformative to like make our city what it is today. Um, so I chose to talk about this one last just because it's like my pet history project thing. I don't know. Um, so it's got some cool stuff in it. Like it's got the Wilson Society there, um, which is a great place you can learn about history and possession. Um, so this is for the most part the end of my talk. This is like a very brief overview of global history. Um, and I kind of hope to just spike your interest. I wanted to pick on a couple things that I thought were interesting that hopefully you would think were interesting. Um, but I wanted to give you a way to learn more about the city's history if you wanted to. Um, so there's lots of things you can do. You can click books like I do, but that can turn into an influence hobby. Uh, so I don't know if I would suggest that, but the public library, each library location will actually have books about the city's history. Um, and some of these here are ones that I used when I was looking up stuff for this talk. Um, but right here in the middle of the Encyclopedia of Louisville, the, the big one by Buehler, I guess, um, it is an incredible book. Um, and it talks about everything in the city. Like, you want to know about the Conrad Conlon House? Just turn to C, and there's four paragraphs on it. Or, like, you want to know, like, what was at the corner of 3rd and Main? Like, it's going to have it in there. It's absolutely astonishing. Um, but my favorite book is probably two to the right. Um, and it's called A Place in Time, and it was by the Courier Journal, and it's a story of Louisville's neighborhoods. So the Courier Journal, I think it was the late 70s, um, sent down a bunch of reporters to each of the neighborhoods of Louisville, um, and they basically said, we want you to research this neighborhood, um, talk to people, figure out what you can, spend time doing this, and then come back, and they were each given two pages to write in. So it goes through every single neighborhood of Louisville. So like, if you live in Clifton, you can turn to Clifton, or if you live in Germantown, or Germantown, or Portland, Portland. Um, and it talks about the history of that. It has interviews with people who lived there in the time, who were in their 90s at the time. So these are people who have lived there a very long time, were born in the pre uh, 1800s, late 1800s. Um, it's an awesome book. It's by far my favorite. You'll also see it all the time in half press books. It's a fairly common book. Um, so that's my next recommendation, is um, if you ever go to half press books or any used bookstores around town, they almost always have books about Louisville's history. Um, the people who live in Louisville really love Louisville, and they've written a lot about the city. Um, so there's a lot to check out there, and they're normally really cheap. Um, the next is if you're a UofL student, it's the easiest. If you're not a UofL student, it's a little bit harder, but you can go to the archives at the University of Louisville Library. Um, and they have most of the Courier Journal's photos they've taken throughout the existence of Louisville, and just tons of books and history. It's a little, it can be a little bit trickier to get into if you're not a U of L student, but I think you can call and get in. It's been a couple of years since I was at U of L, so I don't quite know what the process is. But it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and then there's the Filson Society, which is worth checking out. Um, but there's a lot of ways you can learn about the history of Louisville. Um, and it's a, it's a ton of fun to learn about it. It's a ton of fun to know about the city we live in, um, and the city that Humana is based in. So knowing about the history of the city um, can really, uh, it'll broaden your perspectives a little bit. Um, it'll help you know, like, why things are the way they are, um, and it really can be beneficial in your job. So I can't sit here and like give you a thousand ways that be beneficial in your job. Um, history is often often beneficial on like a more personal level in your job. So you'll have ways that I've never even thought of. Uh, personal fun, but um, and then I'll talk about this photo. This photo is a postcard, uh, and this is the last slide. And what I think is interesting is I stumbled across this postcard not too long ago. Um, I attended a church in Louisville, Old Louisville, and we had a guy just mail us a postcard from California. He was at, I was like, he was like, I was at a thrift store and I found a postcard, so I just mailed it to you all. Um, and this is actually a photo of buildings that um, are no longer there. This was north of St. Catherine, uh, right here on the right where the buildings were is where Disney is, is now. Um, so I think it's a fun photo of buildings that are no longer there. Um, 
Yes, old Dizzy Liz. Um, so I'm open to questions or corrections. I'm sure there's things I've gotten wrong. I'm an amateur at this, um, but I have a lot of fun doing it. So does anybody have any questions or anything they may want to know about that I might? Things you know that I don't. Yes? So a number of years ago, four five, we were up in Boston and touring the first of all, all the uh, house that is there, it's a museum that is there. They still have all of the architectural uh, notes from when he designed multiple parts that were the huge parts. Seneca, Cherokee, Iroquois, uh, Shawnee, and whatever one you're supposed to be. Uh, Central Park. Yeah, Central Park, sorry. Yeah, Central Park. But uh, one of the stories that the So 